I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to cut off the audience, but I did have a couple of reactions to what I heard and I wanted to get into a, a discussion about them. First one has to do with competition. Uh, I've been a proponent of competition for a long, long time. But then it occurred to me that there are some situations where there isn't enough market to sustain multiple competitors. Then what do you do? And one answer to that may be that you need to establish a regulatory regime in which the one, <laughs> the, the only competitor, the, the only uh, supplier uh, is uh, required to uh, make the uh, services available on reasonable conditions. Uh, this gets to uh, a layering, I think, of the um, of where the competition lies. It might be that you can only afford to have one supplier of basic communications capability, but then you want to have multiple suppliers of internet access, uh, allowing people to uh, compete with each other for the higher level applications. But the reason I bring this up is that there are some parts of the world where there is a strong regulatory regime and it has led to very high speed services being available. In Japan, for example, NTT was required by the regulator to offer very broadband services on, a, on an open wholesale basis. So you can get gigabit per second service there for about 8,700 yen a month. I was impressed by that since I can't get that in the United States, <laughs> not, not anywhere close. So um, I wanted to uh, ask you about this uh, balance between a, a market which is sufficiently large to sustain competition and one which might not be. <clears throat> Thank you, and I, I do agree with that. I think competition must not be that you say that you should have a lot of different actors in the same place. You, it could also be that states or region do fund, but don't distort. Because the key issue, as you pointed out regarding sustainability, if you need to have a real good use of the internet, you need to secure that you're not distorting between different operators and different actors. So I think we should differ between the pure technological platforms where you can open up and uh, you can have tenders, for example. But, but what I do see is in rather advanced IT countries as well as in less, that when you have too much of control, you're not securing anything, you're hindering. Uh, and that is the key. And uh, I think some of the examples we have seen here uh, underline that. And, uh, so, so let's not, don't mix up competition with competition because we can have competition and also provide uh, financial support from state or from regional organizations at the same time. Uh, may I do one more? Uh, by the way, there's an old joke. Uh, it, it goes, what's worse than a regulated monopoly? And the answer is an unregulated monopoly. And we have some problems in the United States along those lines where there, in some cases, is insufficient regulatory attention paid to openness. Um, I wanted to bring up one other technological observation. We're getting to the point now where it's technically feasible to provide a substantial array of services uh, in the network. Uh, from Google's point of view, putting my Google hat on, uh, computing in the cloud is turning out to be uh, one possible avenue for providing services to people. It means that they don't necessarily have to have a significant quantity of computing capability or storage locally if you can, be, uh, if you can supply that on, on the network. And the reason I bring this up is not because I'm trying to uh, sell uh, Google here at all. I'm trying to uh, ask whether you can help small businesses and the like to get access to the internet and use its services without necessarily having to have a large staff maintaining local equipment. If you have simple devices at the edges of the net and computing capability and storage and applications, you may be able to spread access to the network more effectively that way. So I, perhaps some of the panelists would have a reaction to that. Maybe not. There's some over here. So Raj, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Uh, there are uh, an additional problem to give internet access to people in remote areas. Most part of the 800 million illiterates are in the remote areas. I would like to stress that we must emphasize to UNESCO that we recommend uh, to the 
literate, national literate programs to qualify the teachers, to qualify the illiterates. That you can't read is not very helpful. Um, but it occurred to me that there is another avenue here which is on the edge of feasibility, and that's to have spoken interfaces rather than written ones. Yeah. And the possibility is that you can speak the language even yeah. if you can't read and write. And to be able to interact by voice would yeah. be a very interesting it alternative. It would be very interesting. And the initial leap to, to illiterate people to get the lifelong education they deserve. Uh, I'm Arun Mehta from India. A software for the blind uh, works very well for the illiterate as well. I mean, this is the, the category is called print disabled or text disabled. That so if you you know it works quite well if you just use that software. Yeah. In in fact, this has there's another salient effect here because if you do something for a very large population that needs the for example the speech interface because of the literacy question. You incidentally solve the problem for blind people, and you know it, it becomes a part of the normal infrastructure. An additional remark. Yeah. An additional remark. Uh, there is a tremendous psychological barrier to illiterate, to get knowledge. If they are in a literacy course, this barrier was uh, removed. So the cost to get access to these people is lower if they are in a literacy course, mm -hmm. OK? The most important cost of a literacy program is to recruit, to mobilize illiterates. Uh, I'm Yaovi at home from Benin. Uh, when we talk about access, I, I think it's very important that we should not consider access only for people living in the area. Uh, I worked for the Linan Initiative some years ago, and uh, we tried to help people to, to have the first gateway in some countries. So I think that today, all the countries, all the government, we need to, to, to think about internet access like water, because sometimes we are limited only to people living in the area. We are all living in uh, the capitals, but we are from remote areas. And we need to go there during the weekends. So we need connection. So we are working in, on Saturday and Friday. We, need to, to, we, are, we are in the village, but we need to work. So we need to consider access in this way. So in this way, uh, sustainability is not necessary. sure, but we need to, to do it. So government, local people, we need to bring access to all the areas, even if this one access point, it is very important. I have a question to, for the project in Brazil about the cost, because we are getting access, but also cost is very important. And we don't need to uh, think most of the time about a broadband internet, because with uh, 33K, I can have email, I can browse. But most of the time, we think about broadband all the time. We need at least a 64K is OK uh, for people. So my, my point is, is this, uh, the cost of the internet uh, accessible for affordable for people. Like in, in the hotel we are living in royalty, uh, it is very expensive. I know that in most of the country, accessing internet in the hotel is expensive. So I don't know why, uh, we, we should think also about the cost. We, we have access and we, we should link both. 80% of the services needed by the rural people we're talking about are available in the country. So again, we seem to be trying to address a totally different angle, make available the information locally, distribute locally, and then the need for the rest of the internet to connect, that's, the, that's a secondary. And I think the, the business and the demand will actually grow that itself. The focus should be actually to make local content available to the rural areas, and then the rest will come in. I mean, the commercial areas already have access to, to the rest of the internet. And naturally, that will expand when, they, when we actually grow the local local area. Thank you. I have one here. Thank you. My name is Alex Gakuru, ICT Consumers Association of Kenya. Thank you, panelists. I have a few comments that I believe could uh, help far-flung consumers who are not connected 
in uh, remote areas to ha have connectivity. One of the issues to achieve this is to make the internet relevant. Of course, we go back to the issue of content so that it becomes a relevant internet. And so there is eager want to get connected. Along this is tied the issue of access to knowledge, uh, where open source and, of course, open access to information like medicine, which is, of course, important in developing countries, makes the internet even more relevant. So the issues are entwined. There is the, also the aspect of infrastructure, shared infrastructure, like uh, countries have got power grids, so you can have overhead fiber in these countries, because wherever power is going, there's bound to be uh, people. So that's a way of accelerating connectivity. The government should also, through the Universal Service Fund, support uh, cooperative, community-based uh, telcos. This assists in uh, reducing the cost of connectivity, and cooperative movements are quite strong in developing countries. And again, it supports in the consumer protection because when they own the companies, they charge their members the cheapest. Thank you very much.